מה את יודעת? מה את יודעת? לא, אין תחושה ברגליים, יש מונח. תגידי, כאילו אין לו תחושה ברגליים, יש מתחת לשבר. הוא אומר שהוא לא יכול להזיז. It's close to midnight in the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights, just a few hundred yards from the increasingly dangerous Syrian border. A team of Israeli soldiers is preparing for a special operation. It's potentially dangerous, and it's the first time they've invited journalists to witness anything like it. <laughs> We wait as the vehicles drive towards the border into darkness. Five minutes later, some news over the radio. So it's gonna be interesting. Before long, the unit returns. The first part of their mission is a success. Only the mission probably isn't what you think. Rather than fighting their enemies, the Israelis are rescuing them. The soldiers are bringing three wounded Syrian fighters into Israeli territory for urgent medical care. What we're seeing here is really quite astounding. A group of Israeli soldiers treating fighters from Syria. You couldn't have imagined it happening two years ago, but it just goes to show how unpredictable the Middle East has become and how much this region is changing. About a mile away in Syria, an Al-Qaeda affiliate known as Jabhat al-Nusra has seized a swathe of land and Syria's army is trying to take it back. This footage is from a bloody battle earlier in the day, most likely where the three rescued Syrians were wounded. Earlier in the day, we drove to a nearby lookout point in a closed military zone to get closer to the fighting. We've come up to the Golan Heights, uh, an area that's controlled by Israel. It's been controlled by Israel since 1967, and this is a tank left over from that period uh, when they fought a war with Syria for control of this area. Since then, this has been the quietest border in Israel. They've only had to deal with conflict pretty much on the Lebanese side and with Gaza. That's starting to change with the civil war in Syria raging for the last two years. This has suddenly become Israel's hottest border. It's easy to hear and see the not too distant sound of shelling. On this day, Al-Nusra forces are fighting the Syrian army for control of the main road to Damascus. You can really see things quite clearly inside Syria from this close up. You can see the streets, uh, you can see all of the detail of the buildings. With binoculars, you can even see the fighters. But as is the case with Syria's deeply complicated civil war itself, it's hard to make out who the fighters are and what exactly they're fighting for. For now, they've largely left Israel alone. And Israel has tried on the surface to appear neutral. But there are new signs that Israel is siding with the rebels. 
United Nations observers recently reported witnessing IDF soldiers allowing what appeared to be two unwounded rebel fighters into Israeli territory. Still, the IDF maintains that its only interaction with rebels is in humanitarian missions like this. <laughs> So we've got the three casualties in there. It looks like the guy on the ground, he's uh, in a lot of pain. The other two seem more or less okay, uh, but they just might be out of it. But this right here, this is the fallout from the most violent war in the world today. They bring the wounded fighters to a nearby hospital. It can't be overstated what an unusual relationship this is for everyone involved. Israelis treating fighters who, in some cases, are bent on Israel's destruction. But since the start of Syria's civil war, about 1,300 Syrians have quietly received medical treatment inside Israel. What's the prognosis for these guys? Are they going to survive? Uh, I think so. They'll be okay. Maybe the guy with his legs will have a long-term treatment, but he'll be okay. What we're seeing is a high level of coordination from the Israeli military directed towards helping these fighters from inside Syria. The question I'm asking myself is, do they have a deal with one particular faction fighting on the other side of the border? And if they do, what is Israel getting in exchange? So far we've seen, uh, according to Israel's own statistics, that 90% of the people that they're treating have been men. So I'm gonna leap to the conclusion that most of them have been fighters. I think Israel sees this as being in its overall interests, but I want to know more specifics. We're here in the Galilee in Israel. We're on our way to a hospital, and uh, the interesting thing about this hospital is that they're actually treating casualties from the war in Syria on this side of the border, and that's pretty unprecedented because you wouldn't expect people from Syria, a sworn enemy of Israel, to want to come here to get medical treatment. But the Israelis have opened their borders and they've actually uh, allowed quite a few people to get treatment. So hopefully we're gonna get to meet some of them. Dr. Amr Hussein oversees the efforts to treat Syrians here at Ziv Medical Center. Is it dangerous for them to try to come here to seek treatment? Yes, it's very dangerous because uh, there is don't want people come to Israel. What do you think would happen to them if they came back and people found out they were in Israel? They may, may be killed. But I understand that some of your patients are actually fighters from the various factions. At the past, the first... Uh, you want to see also the emergency? Sure. Okay. They've actually treated 420 Syrians in this hospital alone, but they've treated 1,300 overall uh, since the start of the conflict in Syria here in Israel. Almost all have been men, so it's not a stretch to assume that many are fighters. We were curious if any belonged to the Al-Qaeda-affiliated rebel group Jabhat al-Nusra, but Dr. Hussein tells us this would be impossible. The army here changed the policy and don't bring uh, again uh, fighters, only, only civilian people. At the first time, yes, there was fighters against Assad for the revolution, mm -hmm. but after, no fighters, only civilian people. 
can see children, we can see very old people, it's not fair to them. I noticed in your statistics that 90% of the people you treat here are men. Are you sure none, none of them are fighters? I don't know, I don't know. This question clearly made the doctor uncomfortable. Maybe justifiably so. The Israeli public might not be too keen on the fact that Israeli doctors are helping fighters who hate Israel only a bit less than they hate the Syrian regime. In Syria's civil war today, more than a thousand factions are fighting each other and the regime for control of the country. To date, more than 190,000 have died in the conflict, and even the tallest fences can't stop ripples crossing the borders. Have you ever seen uh, casualties like this in your experience? No, no. But, I mean, you treat soldiers from... Uh... I treat soldiers from the Lebanon to... Yeah. Uh, we treat also civilian Israelis from the rockets of Hezbollah. Yes, mm -hmm. we treat also. But, uh, like, this injuries is very severe injuries. This patient is a recent arrival. No one knows much about him because he's been unconscious since he got here. He has vascular injuries, abdominal injuries, fracture of uh, the bones, the large bones. What do you think caused his injuries? I think it's more blast injuries. And so he hasn't been able to say anything since no, he no, got no, here? Yeah. He doesn't even know he's in Israel? He doesn't know that he's in Israel, yes. We head into another room where three wounded Syrian fighters have been convalescing since July. Two quickly covered their faces with blankets, but we could see the characteristic long hair of Islamist fighters. Outside, an IDF soldier remains on guard 24 hours a day. One of the three agreed to talk to us, 25-year-old Mohammed, who says he's a fighter for the Free Syrian Army, a collection of Western-backed rebel groups. <laughs> فرحنا لنشوف يعني إذا في إصابات ولا ما في إصابات مشان نس نسعف الناس فلاحظ توصلنا لهناك كانت في منطقة قريبة للنظام فيها جيش ضرب منها علينا بالمدفعية قذائف وقتل مننا اثنين وصابنا إحنا اثنين جينا لهون على مشفى صفد. He said rebels worked through a neutral intermediary to deliver him to IDF soldiers. إحنا وصلنا بسيارة للحدود. Okay. If people find out that you've been to Israel, do you think they might suspect you of being a spy or something? Okay. من العام الماضي يعني توقعت إنه ممكن بأي لحظة واحد يتعرض لإصابة ممكن إنه يدخل على إسرائيل أما أول يعني قبل يعني مستحيل كنت متوقع إنه يدخل على إسرائيل. When your treatment is finished, do you hope to go back to fight against Assad again? طبعاً أنا في عندي حالياً إصابات برجلي يعني ممكن القتال يكون صعب عليه شوي. Okay. يعني بس أنا في لي دور هناك دور كويس هناك يعني ممكن نرجع يعني. Who were you fighting when you got injured? Was it Jabhat al-Nusra or was it the army? This is one of the top tourist destinations in the Israeli-controlled Golan Heights. Up here, on a clear day like today, there's a great view of volcanic hills, sprawling vineyards, and Syria's civil war. So take this scene with you, this surreal moment of being here standing up on this volcanic mountain. There is Zeev, Jabhat and Nusra fighting here together with ISIS against Assad, 52 miles away from here. The guide is a bit confused. ISIS, for now, is nowhere near here. But that is artillery and mortar fire from the Al-Qaeda-affiliated Al-Nusra Front and the Syrian military, locked in a battle for control of the road to Damascus. 
As tourists watch the action here, so does a team of United Nations observers, or at least what's left of it. UN peacekeepers have been monitoring this disputed border since 1974, the end of Israel's last war with Syria. But this past August, al-Nusra took 45 Fijian peacekeepers prisoner when it took control of the border crossing. The soldiers were released two weeks later, but it was enough to spook the force into abandoning its post in Syria. Now they watch the war from the same place as the rest of us. We made several formal attempts to interview the commander of the observer force, but his spokesman told us it wasn't a good time to talk. So when we spotted these Fijian UN observers, we tried to talk to them. Hi, are you from the UN? From the observer mission? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, We're... we cannot say anything. We are not allowed to say anything. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I can't. Nothing at all? No, I cannot, I cannot answer that. <laughs> are you observing now? Is that what you're doing? No, no, we just the tourists. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look like tourists. No. Thank you very much for that. You and guys aren't too talkative. They must be pretty embarrassed that they don't have their checkpoint anymore. They scared them all away. I mean, if they're scared of me, it's no wonder that they're not at their uh, checkpoint down there anymore. Not far from the lookout is Kibbutz Merom Golan, home to about 100 families who work as farmers and in tourism. This popular restaurant is run by the kibbutz, and it's where many UN observers and tourists grab a steak and a glass of local wine after watching Syria's civil war. Ari Golanski manages the restaurant. And he says life hasn't really changed since the Al-Nusra front sees the nearby border crossing. Listen, you're in a war zone. You need a helmet. <laughs> <laughs> he took us on a horseback ride to show us how life goes on. We go up the mountain, so we have the view of the other side of the mountain. Giddy up. No, they don't know this. <laughs> <laughs> this, car, this car literally has a mind of its own. Like even today, when all the bombings go, go on over there, yeah. people work in the fields, we're traveling over here. Uh, the restaurant now is full with people that come uh, to, to dine and tour the Golan Heights and enjoying the weather. And maybe also take a look at the world that's going next to us. It's a weird juxtaposition, being over here so close to it and uh, you know, pretending that you're just on a nature trail. You know, some tourists come because of that. You get like uh, people that want to see that. You don't have a lot of spots where you can be like observers from the side to drink coffee, to sit by and see like a war zone. That was another big one. The sounds today are far in the distance, but increasingly the war is spilling into Israeli territory. The Israeli military says it shot down a Syrian aircraft. The military says the plane infiltrated Israeli airspace over the Golan Heights. It's unclear what may have happened to the pilot. This happened in late spring. The official story was that the Israelis shot down the Syrian Sukhoi 24 aircraft after it flew into the Golan Heights, and that both the pilot and the co-pilot ejected into Syria. But Ari says, he and his neighbors saw what really happened. Yeah, they survived and then they were treated here and go back to Syria after that. So they landed on the Israeli side? Yeah. Can you show me where the uh, jet was shot down? Well, approximately here, in this, in this area. Wow. Okay. That was a big one. Beautiful scenery, huh? Have you ever had any shells come down in this area? Yeah, a few during the night. We, we never saw it during the day. And here you see the crater of a, of a missile that landed here a while back. Oh, this is the crater from, yeah. uh, from a missile? Yeah. yeah, well, what can be done about this massive civil war in Syria? Well, again, I'm not the address to ask this, uh, this question. Yeah. But uh, people get killed there on a daily basis. The question is, uh, who's willing uh, to interfere and stop it? You know, we, we don't think we, sh we are not part of the problem and we don't have to be part of the solution. We will defend ourselves if we need to, we are ready for that. But look, we're traveling here, there's a bomb going on over here and we don't feel scared. We don't feel like uh, we're in any threat. So, so, f so far for us, we just feel bad for the citizens that get killed over there. That's the reality.
A few miles from the kibbutz is an abandoned Syrian military training facility. A friend of Ari's brings us to the roof after warning about possible sniper fire. I thought we weren't supposed to go out on the roof. We are not supposed, but just for a quick view. Jabat al-Nusra, Al-Qaeda affiliate, they're just on the other side of that fence now, controlling a lot of this territory on your border. How does that make you feel? Hearing the news about ISIS, they think, okay, thanks God that we don't have ISIS here. <laughs> and if Al-Qaeda call ISIS crazy, yeah. so we said, okay. We'd so rather have them. <laughs> yeah. Everything we is have, relative, huh? Yeah. Seems like that for them also keeping the border quiet, it's a, it's a common entrance. Right now, we're just about 300 yards from the new border fence that Israel has built since the start of the civil war in Syria. There's an Israeli flag on this side over here, a minefield left over from the wars with Syria in the 60s and 70s. But just over there, beyond the UN checkpoint, there's a building with the black flag of al-Nusra flying on the top. We're driving to a village in the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. It's called Majd al-Shams, and everyone who lives here is Druze, one of Israel's religious minorities. We're here with Brick. He's a Druze uh, hey. from the city of Majd al-Shams, uh, here in the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. And one of the consequences of uh, Israel coming here after the war with Syria is that uh, the Druze have been split off from villages uh, that are left over in Syria that are also Druze. He's going to tell us what life is like here since the civil war started inside Syria and how that has made it even harder for Druze people to communicate uh, with their uh, cousins and family on the other side of the fence. So I just grab it. It's a pretty big village. How many people live here? They're pretty much like a 10,000 people mm -hmm. lives around here. Pretty There's, much everyone is Druze? Yeah, everybody is Druze. Yeah. Everybody. There's no other religion people here. Mm -hmm. There's only Druze. And Majd al Shams is the biggest village between the Golan Heights villages. Got it. And as you can see, all the mountains right over there, you yeah. can see the road, that's the Syria. I mean, we can go over there and see the border. It's right next to the houses. There's our houses and there's the border of the Syria. Until recently, it was easier to pass back and forth across the border. Dozens of residents of Majd al-Shams studied in Damascus, and it was normal for local men to marry Syrian women. But war and a new fence has stopped that completely. Nabi and Hanan met while studying at a university in Damascus. She was from there, he was from here. Back in 1998, they were married on the border, along with nine other couples. So this is the ceremony for crossing the border. You're crying. She never thought it would be so hard to return. So uh, have you been able to see your parents since you left? Yes, <laughs> Who's the soldier with the Syrian flag in the picture? I'm going to go to the 
وخطفوه فتره ثلاث شهور ورجعوا بعثوا لنا انه هن صفوه يعني Does she ever regret um, coming to uh, the Golan Heights? No, it's not a story. 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 طبعا بعد ما انا صار عندي اولادي وبيتي وصار في لي هون يعني اسره يعني بتحس انه لا في شيء بيربطني هون بس قضيه الحنين ال... الاهل يعني بضل بضل شوخك للاهل يعني ما فيك تتعدى What do you think about uh, this new fence that the government built here do you think it's necessary هو اسه جدار اسمه نحن ما بنعرف ليش عملوه اصلا يعني يعني ما حدا بيعرف ليه عملوه يعني نحن نحلم دائما كنا انه على القليل اذا بده يضل الوضع كيف هو احتلال والى اخره يضل على القليل في تواصل نروح ونجي يعني انا كثير بتمنى انه اهلي يجوا لعندي يشوفوا بيتي مثلا يزوروني هون بس بس كان حلمنا البسيط انه يضل يضل طريقنا نحن لعنده We're at the border between the Israeli occupied Golan Heights and Syria. That's the fence in the distance. We're watching the Israeli Defense Forces train for a very dangerous and incredibly real scenario, an infiltration by rebels from al-Nusra Front. For now, they're busy fighting the Syrian regime, but the Israeli army knows there's a very real possibility that they'll one day turn towards Israel. And so, the Israelis try to remain vigilant and ready. These are members of a special IDF unit made of Bedouin trackers. Okay, so basically what's happened is they've sent one of the guys into the bushes. Uh, he's going to pretend he's just come over the border fence. Two of the soldiers here, uh, they're going to have to track him and find him, shoot and kill him. But it's not for real, so he's going to be okay. Bedouin are living in the land, they live in the land, they live in the land, they live in the land, they know that all the things on the land, even the change, even if they have a little bit of a change, they can know if they have a change, if they have a change, if they have a change, or a change. And so if you patrol a section of the border, can you feel confident that you can realize just by having looked at it whether somebody has gone across? So this circle here, that's the trackers. They've marked uh, one of the footprints of the guy playing the terrorist. I think they got someone. After about five minutes, they find the fake infiltrator and finish him off. وبديك تنا علايم توفست تنا علايم على المنات اللي بدوك يم زي أوتون علايم شالخنو كل زمان في زي أوتون علايم مخبيل خسال The realest thing about this whole exercise is that it's actually happening right next to the border fence. This fence was put here about a year ago because the security situation has changed so rapidly. For 40 years, there was no fence at all, and uh, somehow the Syrians and the Israelis managed to keep to each other's side. But now that it's so unpredictable in Syria, they've decided that only a five, six meter fence like this would do. Controlling the border is just one way Israel is protecting itself from an attack from Syria. The Israeli military is also watching the positions of Syrian rebels and regime forces from up here. We're heading up uh, Mount Hermon. It's the highest point under Israeli control. Uh, on the other side of the mountain are Lebanon and Syria. We're with a uh, lieutenant colonel from the Israeli military, and he's going to show us around. <laughs> This remote military post rarely gets civilian visitors. 
and we were directed to point our cameras away from certain buildings. Every day we hear explosions and shots on the other side. It's fighting between Lebanese and Syrian army, but we know there are many weapons and determined people on the other side. If they decided they wanted to fight against us, they can do it, and we, we, we must be prepared for it. So that's why this post is built this way. Down there you can see Jabhat al-Nusra. It's in the south, Khader, a Druze village. A few Syrian villages. That's uh, Beit Jan, Mazrat Beit Jan. Currently, this place is controlled by the FSA. The FSA, the Free Syrian Army, it's controlling this uh, area. They're pretty close. Do you talk to them? Well, we can watch them. It's behind the border. After all, it's Syria. It's a different country. We have to observe them, them very carefully because we always have to understand what they are trying to do. So you're talking with your guns <coughs> more than with your walkie-talkies so far? Uh, with the other side? Yeah. Uh, as, you, as you can understand, the other side has, are holding guns. Yeah. And uh, so that's the way we have to talk to them. But what makes things especially complicated is that the Syrian regime is also a threat. Well, as far as I understand, none of the people who control the other side of the border, Jabhat al-Nusra or the other rebels, signed any ceasefire agreements with Israel. They're exactly. a completely new group of people. Exactly. So that's why we are observing them all the time. We try to understand what they are trying to do, what they want to do, what are their interests. We don't have an agreement, but uh, when one side understands what the other side wants, you can react in the, in the right way. But ultimately, do you think um, they see Israel as their enemy and they're going to, whoever wins out in this fight in Syria is eventually going to set their sights on Israel? That's a possibility, of course. That's a possibility. We know that we are on their list of enemies, but not on their top. Who's at the uh, top right now? The Syrian army, of course, the Syrian regime. What do you say to people who think that this uh, works out well for Israel, the fact that uh, so many of its enemies are busy fighting each other? Uh, it depends, because we would like to have peace and stability. Any reasonable person, uh, of course, uh, government or army, would like to work in a condition of peace and stability. As I said before, we were in a state of war with uh, Syria for 41 years but not even one shot was fired from the Syria border. So there was not peace with Syria, but there was stability. We knew that there was someone controlling the other side and we know what to expect. Um, and we had understandings based on interests. What about now? But now you can't exactly anticipate what is coming, uh, what is uh, about to happen tomorrow and what is coming in the next few months or years. We can't anticipate exactly, we don't know. But when you don't have anyone reasonable or someone that uh, dominates, dominates the entire country, it's a problem. So Israel is in wait-and-see mode? Exactly. <laughs>